So it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, our la last main speaker, Dr. Christopher Anker, who comes to us via the State University of New York where he did his medical uh, degree and then uh, out to the state of Utah where at their cancer center did radiation oncology and Chris for a variety of reasons has uh, uh, special interest in skin cancer, which for some reason, which no one seems to completely explain, in Vermont, uh, we actually have a very inordinate uh, amount of uh, a type of skin cancer called melanoma, so we all need to be cognizant of it. Uh, just as an antidote, my wife's a family doc, and I think she's diagnosed two melanomas in the supermarket line since she's been here, uh, saying, you got to get that checked. So uh, the, the, some of the tricks uh, Dr. Anker's going to teach us, you know, count, you know, for us helping to diagnose others as well as protect ourselves. Dr. Anker also is, is an incredibly uh, um, bright and upcoming scientist, and I sit with him on the protocol review committee, and it's always refreshing because he could look through these complex protocols and tell us what's safe or not, and we really appreciate him for that, too. So, Dr. Anker, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Kat. All right, thank you for having me today. So, I'm going to be talking about skin cancer and how it's not just a summertime disease, but I'll also be addressing various other important points as well. So at the end of my talk, I hope you understand more about the epidemiology, risk factors, diagnosis, and a general overview of the treatment options. So first I want to talk about the normal architecture of the skin. So the epidermis, the very surface of your skin, is, is quite thin. It's only a two one-hundredths to three-tenths thick and there are no blood vessels in it, so that's why if you nick it, you don't bleed. But just a little bit deeper down, there's the dermis, which is one to three millimeters thick, and that does contain blood vessels. Um, also sweat glands, and below that is the hypodermis. So hypo means below, so below the dermis, and that also contains connective tissue, like collagen, fat, and uh, nerves as well. So, when referencing the normal architecture of the skin, you can see that most cancers of the skin arise from the epidermal area. So you can see my mouse here. There is a basal layer of keratinocytes. So these are the cells that produce keratin, which provides some protection to the outside of your skin. Basal means low, lower level. So they're kind of on the basement of the epidermis here. Um, and that's where basal cell carcinomas arise. And then another very common skin cancer, uh, squamous cell uh, cancer, so SCC, those arise from the keratinocytes themselves, a little bit closer to the surface of the skin. And melanocytes, which produce melanoma eventually if they're um, injured and, and mutate, are at the dermal epiderm uh, epidermal junction. And so those are cells that produce pigment. So with regards to non-melanoma skin cancer, so it's the most common malignancy. And in 2010, there were 2 million cases. So expect more than that now in 2016. And so that's greater than all other cancers combined, to put that in perspective. And in 2015, all other, all other cancers combined to make a grand total of 1.66 uh, million. And there are more basal cell cancers than squamous cell cancers at a ratio of about four to one. And so this is very costly for the healthcare system, uh, over $400 million a year. And so for what could be, in, in many cases, a preventable disease, but, but certainly not all. So the cause that many of you know about is UV light. So there are various energies of ultraviolet light, and it uh, comes from the sun. So UVA is lower energy than UVB, but it penetrates more deeply. So sunscreen on the surface, uh, regardless of the SPF even, you can have those UVA arrays go through the sunscreen. And that's why people can still tan, even though they have the sunscreen on. And if you remember before what I talked about, the hypodermis, the connected tissue and fat below the dermis, if you injure that area, that's what causes the skin to age. And so UVA is primarily responsible for that. And so squamous cell cancers and basal cell cancers have a little bit different etiologies or causes, but they're pretty similar in a lot of uh, instances. So for squamous cell being a little bit closer to the surface, UVB causes more cancers than UVA. And you know, I'm sure you've heard about tanning beds and the controversy, does it or does it not cause cancer? It's hard to always really put your finger on whether something causes something else, but they're strongly associated with increased risk of cutaneous malignancy. 
And uh, interestingly, squamous cell cancers were significantly increased by tanning bed use by about 67%, even though you, um, the tanning beds typically use uh, the UVA um, rays. That's typically what patients are getting from those machines. And the risk of developing these cancers is inverse to the uh, melanin content in the skin. So more pale people have a higher risk of skin cancer. And in, ter in terms of intense severe burns, so those can put people at risk for cancers as well of the skin, and, and predominantly basal cell more than, than squamous cell. So what can you do to help prevent it and try to avoid the UV exposure? That's you know, prevention um, is ideally if you just avoid the situation altogether, right? And so you can avoid 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., which is in general the um, time of the day where you might get the most UV exposure. Um, protective clothing will help as well if you have a wide-brimmed hat or long sleeves. So you can still have some penetration through clothing, and there are various garments that have some additional sun protection, which are a good idea. But it's okay to wear long sleeves in the summer, uh, you know, and uh, if it's going to help you out with preventing some serious problems like down the line. And then sunscreen is important too. Now I, I do understand in the last talk, so it's going to be maybe hard to keep your attention the whole time. So I'm trying to put some questions along the way uh, to the group. So sunscreen should contain the following to offer the best protection. Does, does anyone know? I mean, it's, you can just shout out the answer. You know, no one's, I'm not going to hold you to anything. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so, so that's the most important stuff to contain is the zinc oxide and or titanium dioxide. So what these do, they're physical barriers. So they directly block the rays from uh, going into the skin. So that's useful because you know, with sunscreen, like I said before, you, know, you still might get some of that UVA going on through. And the, the best stuff for that uh, to prevent it is, um, is B, the zinc, or the zinc oxide, even more than the titanium dioxide. But the titanium dioxide can block some of the UVB um, better than the zinc oxide. So now you, you might think, well, you know, I don't want that white chalky stuff on me. They're, they're doing better and better at getting things more more thin, grinding it up so it's less um, apparent to, to people. But you know, I've, I've given up looking cool a long time ago, so I put that stuff on every morning. And you can get some thin stuff that you can't really notice. Uh, so I, I certainly recommend considering that for everyone. So other etiologies, because we talked about it not just being a summertime disease, of course you can have UV exposure any time of the year. Um, but there are other things that cause it as well, like ionizing radiation. So ionizing radiation, so I'm a radiation oncologist. This is what I, I do to try to kill cancers. So unfortunately, you can cause some damage to the DNA cells and because the radiation goes through the skin, and that can lead to skin cancers that, that could be very dangerous. So people might get my radiation for the treatment of cancer, of course, and it can take many years for a cancer to occur. You know, I've, I've had patients who were treated for a brain cancer decades ago, and then they come in with a skin cancer right near their ear, um, which can be fatal and has even um, led to the death of some of my patients, very sadly. And it's, it's pretty wild to think about this, but back when radiation was just getting going, we used to do it for some pretty out there indications. And it worked. Acne, eczema, psoriasis, fungal infections. Radiation got rid of those problems. But we know now that is not a good idea because it caused bigger problems with skin cancer. And then for atomic bomb survivors, you know, basal cell carcinoma was typically um, increased more than squamous cell because UVA was um, yeah. um, kind of a more UVA um, type of effect where the skin was penetrated more deeply. Immunosuppression is a big risk factor uh, for skin cancer. And some patients, I mean, they, they can't help it. They have a kidney fail, a heart fail, and they have a solid organ transplantation. Um, people might have an HIV infection. They might be on long-term steroid use. And how immunosuppression causes cancer, well, it decreases the immune surveillance to eliminate abnormal cells. So our immune system doesn't just fight bacteria and viruses. It really does help with mutated abnormal cancer cells, which really shouldn't belong there. And also, the immunosuppressive drugs themselves can maybe lead to some problems with repair as well, leading to these cancers. So how big a problem could it be? Well, in one study out of uh, the Netherlands and Norway, patients who had an uh, organ transplant were up to 250 times higher um, uh, as likely to develop one of these skin cancers. Uh, in the US, 35% of patients in one study are, um, developed a skin cancer within 10 years. 
And then if you look at other places like Australia, where there's not as much ozone, where patients are at more of a risk um, anyway, about 50% of people developed a cancer within 10 years of transplant. And then places where maybe a little more ozone, maybe a little more overcast, like uh, England, it's more like 10% of risk. So it, it's geographically dependent as well, um, not just whether or not you've had a transplant. And then if you get one cancer, you're at a much higher risk for getting a second cancer. So you just have to keep seeing your primary care or dermatologist and get the surveillance going strong. So other reasons why you might get um, one of these cancers is a chronic inflammation, you know, like if a diabetic or um, gets a wound or someone gets an injury in their shin where there's not as much of a blood supply, it can lead to a chronic ulcer, just a wound that isn't healing very well. And that could even transform into uh, a cancer, and it's really squamous cell cancer. And those are called margillans ulcers. Other factors that could lead to these cancers are arsenic, genetic uh, alterations, family history, and inherited disorders. So how might you identify these lesions? Now, I'm, I'm not a dermatologist, but I'll do my best to help lead you through this. Uh, so for basal cell carcinoma, which is the most common skin cancer, most of them uh, are on the face, scalp, and neck. And they have an appearance where they have these telangiectasias, meaning like capillaries or blood vessels on the surface, uh, some, some prominent vasculature. They have pearly borders, so they might have this sort of um, um, uh, look like they, um, like inside of an oyster shell, how you have that translucence. And a central ulceration is very common, uh, common, and these rolled, raised edges, like you can see in these two pictures here. So other, it can come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, there's a superficial type, which is a little less common at 30% of the basal cells, I mean, more on extremities in the trunk than the face, like the other kind. And they're um, more scaly patches, a patch, something kind of flatter, and they have irregular borders. And then something more uncommon, fortunately, is this more pheoform type, which is harder to identify. You can see, I mean, it's very hard to even see in this picture, even with the arrows, where this thing is. It's um, kind of flat and even depressed a little bit with indistinct margins. Uh, so it kind of feels firm in, in the area as well. So squamous cell carcinoma, um, you know, less common, fortunately, because it is at a higher risk of spreading to lymph nodes and other parts of the body, but still at a very low risk. Basal cell almost never does that sort of thing, but it, it can happen. So these squamous cells kind of are red and, and crusty. They friable means they might bleed easily. They're ulcerating, and there might be some uh, inflammation around the area. So what is inflammation? So or induration and, and inflammation, but induration so a hard in the area. Uh, so this is hard to see, but the prognosis depends on various items for these two different kinds of cancers. Uh, so it depends on the size of the cancer. Um, it depends on location. Uh, is it invading bone? You know, for um, T1 and T2 tumors, T stands for tumor. So looking at the T stage, so tumors that are less than two centimeters have um, Less, are, are less, I'm sorry, T1 tumors are, are less than two centimeters and they um, have less than two high risk features. So what are these high risk features I was speaking of? How, how thick the tumor is, uh, where it is. So a high risk feature would be if it's on, a, on the ear, um, the hair bearing lip, so upper lip, and then differentiation is important as well. And so are lymph nodes and lymph node involvement. So in terms of uh, differentiation, just to kind of give you an example of what differentiation means. That's how close to a normal cell a cancer cell looks. So back when I mentioned you know, squamous cell carcinomas arise from the keratinocytes, the cells that produce keratin, which helps protect your skin. So an, a more normal cell might look like this, where you still see this, this keratin near the cells. But the more abnormal the cell is, the more poorly differentiated it is, and the higher risk that, it, uh, that a patient is for having the tumor come back. Uh, especially squamous cell cancer can jump onto the nerves as well, and that can be uh, a higher risk feature for it coming back if it gets along a nerve. Um, and so when you put all these things together, you know, if you have lymph node involvement, you're at least a, a stage three, if not stage four. But unlike some other cancers, you don't have to have a disease spread to other parts of the body to be stage four, so you could still be potentially curative even with a stage four disease. So what can you do? You can, there's a lot of treatment options for these skin cancers. There's Mohs surgery, uh, local excision, cut it out, um, electrodesiccation, so kind of other ways of um, 
burning the area, cryotherapy, freezing it, and radiation, and topical chemotherapy. And it's important to really consider a lot of things when choosing a treatment because cure rates are so good for most tumors, a lot um, of other things are important, like what are the complications? What's the cosmesis going to look like? You know, the convenience and the cost as well. So just like I was saying, Mohs has a very, very good cure rate for most tumors, and so does everything else. So when might you do Mohs surgery? Well, you can use this in many different parts of the body. And what's great about this is the surgeon, uh, usually a dermatologist specifically trained in it, uh, they only take as much tissue as they really need. So they'll do a resection around the tumor, and then they'll actually look at it during the same procedure under a microscope. So instead of sending it to the you know, pathologist in the lab, they're looking at it right then and there. And what they do is they can tell, based on their excision, where there might be a close or positive margin, and then they take more tissue. And they'll just keep going back until there's no tumor left that they can see under the microscope. So when you can have confirmation that day there's no tumor left, that's a good sign that it probably won't come back. So when might you use radiation? So maybe if surgery could cause some sort of a, a problem, you know, like a functional problem, like an eyelid, taking out part of the eyelid, you can imagine maybe your eyelid's not going to close normally anymore. Um, the nose, um, the pinna, which is you know, part of your ear, uh, and, and large lip lesions. And there's a lot of ways you can do radiation to try to make it work for a person. Typically, you do it over four weeks. It can be done more quickly, but the more you break up the radiation dose into smaller treatments, the better a body is able to recover from uh, the injury from radiation on a day-to-day -day basis. The normal stuff, the good stuff, can recover, whereas the cancer cells, they just keep dying even though you break it up. And so you can decrease the chance of your, your skin having blood vessels very apparent where the radiation goes, um, the skin looking pale, uh, even death to the normal tissue, which is exceptionally rare because we have so much experience, we know how to avoid it now. And just atrophy, meaning wasting of the area and, and scarring or fibrosis. So for example, this young woman um, who had a basal cell of the eyelid, instead of going for a surgery and potentially having a large uh, um, defect in the area, and she was given radiation. And this is lead here to help uh, prevent the radiation from going on through. Now lead helps with electrons. There's different ways of doing radiation without getting too technical. Photons are um, like you know, radiation from the sun. You know, it just keeps going forever, and like an x-ray, it just keeps going through you, even as it, it passes through you. There's still a lot of energy on the other side. Whereas electrons are kind of like throwing a baseball. So it's a form of radiation, can cause injury to cancer cells, but it only goes so far. So that's the kind we like to use for treating skin cancer, because it's really just hitting the surface of the skin, and lead can help prevent penetration from electrons, whereas photons, it'll really just go right through it. So this woman had 16 treatments. And um, you can see at the end of treatment, she had some redness in the area. And then at 15 years later, now it's not the a perfect picture, but you really didn't have any cosmetic problem uh, from the radiation. And just some other examples. This person had a large squamous cell of the lip. And so you try to avoid the good lip um, you know, near the tumor. You try to avoid the gums behind it, because that can be very painful if you radiate the normal mucosa. And you know, this patient had two years, very good function, uh, normal, normal acting lip. Because if this patient went for a surgery, and um, you know, what could happen is they have a chunk of the lip taken out. And if you can imagine you know, trying to, to drink when your lip doesn't have the same contour and it has this defect in it, you have a good chance of dribbling. And a lot of these patients need to drink through a straw because that's the only way they can drink without, without dribbling their, their fluids. So it's, it's a very good cure rate using a surgery, but it's not just about the cure. It's everything else, function, quality of life, and all that goes with it. So which is why I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to give this talk, <laughs> even though I'm a radiation oncologist. It's good, to, good exposure to other options besides just surgery. This uh, person, basal cell carcinoma, you can see that's right around the eye. And you can imagine the surgery to be difficult to get a good cosmetic outcome. Uh, 24 treatments for this person. And um, two years afterwards, you really can't notice too much of a defect. That hypochromosis, meaning lower color, you can see how it is more pale in the area and maybe a little bit more uh, visibility of blood vessels. So the cosmesis certainly isn't perfect, but really surgery was not a good option for that patient. It would have led to much more cosmetic um, and, and structural problems. 
So now shifting gears to melanoma, the risk factors are very similar uh, to the non-melanoma skin cancers that I discussed before, the squamous cells and the basal cells. UV radiation with tanning beds and from the sun, genetic susceptibilities, and immunosuppression. So just some research that's been done on this uh, in terms of tanning bed use. Uh, there is a, a very large international study that found that um, there was a 70% increase in melanoma risk for people who started, especially earlier in life, in their teens and 20s. And the group recommended that, you know, really, at, at least for people under 18, don't do it. It's just like smoking. You know, just people when they're adults, you know, you can make your own mistakes, but you know, at least some, some oversight, some more oversight when they're still a minor. And a lot of countries have outlawed it uh, under 18, and there's a lot more oversight with at least parental permission being required in many states. Uh, so there's also a population-based study looking at people who used tanning beds versus didn't. That's what a case control study is. And this included men and women. Now, many more women use tanning beds than men in the study. So it was uh, a little more challenging to find the risk correlation between tanning bed use and melanoma. But it, it seemed quite apparent and, and very clear for the, the woman. It was up to a six-fold increase for women and, and two-fold for men, mainly around the trunk. The melanoma increased by about two-fold for men in the trunkal area. And the highest risk was people uh, or women who started under age 25 and went um, over 10 times. So patients diagnosed during the study, uh, interestingly, corresponded in, in, in Minnesota um, to an increase in incidence of melanoma by about 5% uh, per year for women and 2% per year for men. And so, I um, apologize. So it, it really does seem like this is a problem. The tanning beds really caused a big problem, leading to more melanoma. So I'm glad there are more constraints being put on these, um, these uh, institutions. Other ways you might get melanoma, you know, so genetic predispositions like I spoke about before. There's a um, condition called xeroderma pigmentosum, which is where the body just can't repair the damage from the UVA um, light as well. And so these patients just are, are so sensitive to uh, injury from, from light, and, and they have a tendency to develop skin cancer. And another uh, potential genetic problem is this um, syndrome called familial a typical mole melanoma syndrome, uh, FAM. And so it's inherited. People have a lot of moles in this syndrome, and uh, people may have a history of melanoma. And they also may have an increased risk for other malignancies like pancreatic cancer. So what's, what's interesting about melanoma is the very wide range at diagnosis. So almost one in five people are diagnosed before age 45. The average age is around age 60. And so the incidence is, is increasing, like I mentioned. And there's a lot of what we say life years lost from melanoma, which is particularly frustrating as a, as a practitioner because I mean, I've had people in their teens frequently come in with these melanomas. And it's just, just really heartbreaking when they recur and progress because those melanomas aren't any kinder to the younger people than the older people. And so that's what I mean by life years. So if you have someone who's in their 70s that dies from the cancer, well, maybe they live Maybe, maybe 30 years, but maybe only a few years. Whereas someone who's a teenager dying of melanoma, that's a lot of life years lost from a disease. And you know, they might have some genetic susceptibility, but a lot of this can be from um, UV exposure and even tanning bed use. So here's just a graph showing that um, the, the incidence of melanoma is rising from 1975 on this graph up to 2011, which is displayed here. So melanoma is, is this one. I'll, I have a little mouse cursor here if you can see this. It's a hard color to see. And um, so it's, it's going up um, really for both genders, which is, I think is important to note. You know, I mean, the tanning bed use in the prior study showed it was going up more for women. Um, but for all comers, I mean, men and women, this is a, becoming more and more of a problem. So the incidence is lower than a lot of cancers, but it's still the fifth most common uh, cancer in men and um, the seventh in women. So in terms of, of deaths from melanoma, it is lower down the line, um, but it's still you know, 2.1% 2, 2 uh, of patients who are diagnosed die per year from melanoma for men and 1.5% for, for women. And so it's important to know, well, well, so what are the stages of these people when they're diagnosed? And most people just have the tumor you can see, about four out of five. It hasn't spread to lymph nodes. And I just, just briefly, I, I mentioned lymph nodes are like the body's filter system. They're trying to fight infection, but also 
these lymph nodes can capture the cancer cells. And um, fewer people have distant disease. And why um, this uh, diagnosis is more advanced for, for black people in this study, you know, it's not really well described in, in the paper here, but it could be in part access to care. Uh, and in terms of five-year survival rates, you know, not, not surprisingly, it's not as good survival when you have it spread to lymph nodes and to other areas. But for some people, even if it hasn't spread to lymph nodes, but it's really deep, uh, that's a bad thing. When, when the tumor is very deep, it goes deep, it's a worse prognosis, and that can even be worse uh, than having it spread to lymph nodes. And also, if the tumor ulcerates, if there's a, a crater on top of it, and that mm, ulceration might only be visible if using a microscope, that portends a worse prognosis as well. So, all right, another question. Let's see, if, see who knows this one. The A, B, C, D, E criteria for melanoma uh, includes all the following except which one? Which one is that? Um, let's, w which, no, not evolution. It is, yeah, so, so D, depth. So it's, that's um, prognostic, but it's, um, it's, it's, it doesn't help you diagnose it because that depth is actually something you look at under a microscope after it's diagnosed and cut out. So it's depth, the diameter, you, you don't want these, it's diameter, not depth. Right? It'd be a little tricky there, but you don't want it more than six millimeters or about a quarter of an inch. So, you know, just in terms of all these A, B, C, D, E's. Um, so A for asymmetry, if it's a symmetrical mole, good. If it's not, more concerning. Uh, perhaps the borders for B are, are uneven. That's a good one. That's a bad one. Um, C, color. So if it's multiple colors, that's more concerning as well. Diameter, as I mentioned, larger than a quarter inch. And then if these moles are, are changing in size, so evolution. So you might have a mole that has even all these A, B, C, D, but you know, if they've been there your whole life and they're really not changing, then you can rest assured. But you might not know that because it might be hard to know what all your moles are doing. So it's good to get checked out by your primary dermatologist so you know what is occurring over time. It's hard to do this all on your own. But Maybe you can diagnose it in the <laughs> supermarket with some experience, and maybe anyone could uh, with some, some education about this. So where, where can melanoma occur? Anyone um, have an answer for this one? Kind of a, a gimme, right? The E is a good answer when it's in all the above. So what's important to know is that melanoma can occur in areas that really don't see the light of day. So again, going back to that not just a summertime disease, there, there's no association between UV light and melanomas of the muc mucous membranes, so vaginal areas, anal areas. There's really no clear reason why people get melanoma in those areas. Uh, fortunately, it's very rare, and you know, only about 1% or so of all melanomas are in these mucosal air areas like the, uh, like the anus. So what's the most important treatment for um, non-metastatic mel mel melanoma, or melanoma that hasn't spread throughout the body? Yep, surgery. So let's really defer to the surgeons on this one. So surgery involves not just cutting right next to the tumor like a Mohs surgery, which is what I described as an excellent treatment for basal cell and squamous cell cancer. So what you want to do is get a good centimeter or two beyond what you see for a melanoma. And depending on what the biopsy shows before this wide local excision, you may or may not have your lymph node sampled as well. So typically these are diagnosed with a biopsy, uh, it shows melanoma, and then a specifically a melanoma surgeon, and not a dermatologist, will go in and perform this large surgery where they, they go deep. They go right down to the surface of the muscle, right through the hypodermis and, um, and fat, right to the bottom. So it's, it's a pretty involved procedure. So in the prior slide, you know, there are other options, right? There are other options of chemotherapy, radiation, immunotherapy, and they may be appropriate depending on the situation. Uh, for example, for radiation-wise, I might give radiation for a certain type of melanoma called desmoplastic melanoma after it's resected. You know, patients who have melanomas that are desmoplastic, and that's the type of cell that you see under the microscope, 
have um, a higher risk of it coming back if it's on the face, if it's really deep, um, and if it invades the nerves. So I would add radiation in that case. But in generally, I won't for uh, the place where the tumor was resected. Sometimes if the tumors are large and they kind of went through the capsule of a lymph node and parts of the body like the, the axilla or armpit or groin, I might add radiation to those areas to prevent the tumor from coming back. But something that's more exciting these days is immunotherapy. And you might have even seen a commercial for it on, on TV for lung cancer or otherwise. But it really started with melanoma because that's often how we've been treating it for a while, just with different types of immunotherapy. Some of the more exciting drugs right now are drugs that put a break on the immune system. Uh, I'm sorry, that take off the break of the immune system. So there are uh, drugs like something called ipilimumab, uh, which is uh, an anti-CTLA4 um, antibody. So the CTLA4 says, all right, immune system, calm down. You know, let's shut off the response. But if you give this drug, then the immune system stays ramped up, and it could fight cancers like melanoma and allows the body's T cells to fight the melanoma. And you can see in this, in this study here, uh, this was the groundbreaking study which looked at people with stage 4 disease. So it spread to parts of the body like the liver and lungs, generally thought to be incurable. And look, you know, over, um, you know, over four years out, almost 20% of people are still alive. You know, we don't say that they're cured. We don't, we don't like saying that word because there's always a chance that something could come back. But still, this is much better than saying, I'm sorry, there's, there's really not much we can do. You know, you only have so much, so, so much time left to live. There are some people that are doing extremely well. And then also what's going on these days is adding the, the drugs together. Um, so one patient I treated many years back had this melanoma recur uh, throughout the neck, all the way up to next to his ear. And it couldn't be cut out. And so the, the best treatment option surgery was not there for him. Uh, so what can we do? Well, I, what we did is we gave him that ipilimumab with radiation. And the disease went away completely. And he's now years out without any evidence of recurrence. So there's now hope for some of these people that, where there didn't used to be hope in the past. And so I'm on some committees uh, with national cooperative groups trying to work to me mesh these treatments together to see you know, what, what's this doing to the immune system and how can we best uh, combine therapies to get an even better outcome than we have right now. So a lot of hope for the future. You know, we, don't like to see the incidence of any cancer increasing, so there's so much you can do to prevent it. But it's, it's also an exciting time because there is so many advances that are occurring right now. And it's nice to be a part of that, being able to combine what I do with radiation with what everyone else is doing. So any questions for me? Mm-hmm. And the research that I've uh, read looking at that haven't found any clear association. I've heard that as well. It's, it's a valid concern. You know, we have to worry about all these. It seems like we're always learning about new carcinogens. Uh, but there's really no clear link. And it's also risk and benefits. You know, there's anecdotal incidences about almost anything. But when you know that sunscreen can help prevent problems, and when you know you, if you don't use a tanning bed before you know, 25, and that'll decrease your risk of melanoma. So there's just so much you, you can do, um, risk and benefits. Yeah, one other question. Maybe you're older than me, but anecdotally, you've heard that if you give a lot of sunscreen, it decreases the mortality of acceleration. I, I haven't heard that before. I, I've read some studies about, you know, HPV um, virus. And you may have heard about that. And, causing squamous cell carcinomas of the head and neck, of the anus, of various parts of the body, not just like cervical cancer. But there's been no clear causative um, association found, no really strong correlation between like HPV and squamous cell skin cancer or smoking and skin cancer. Just some associations which can be looser. Yes. I'm not sure if it's that we're just finding it more. It, it may be a part of it all, but there are certainly some studies, like the one that I, I cited, where they really think that this, at least some of this increase, is uh, the use of some higher risk 
activities like tanning beds. Now, we would hope that people are also using sunscreen more, because I know that's uh, been more visible in, in terms of uh, a recommendation in recent times than it was decades ago. Uh, let's see. I don't know who was first. Uh, someone over here. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what my understanding is for Vermont. I have attributed to perhaps a more out, um, active outdoor lifestyle without sunscreen use, uh, but I don't know about the north. I mean, for Australia, I mean, some of the best research in melanoma comes out of Australia, and so that's where uh, you know, I looked for, for a lot of information, great um, colleagues there, but that's an ozone problem, you know, not, not just north. for for just uh, in Canada, I, I can say it's, it's most like Florida, you know, there's a lot higher incidence for where people are getting hit harder by the UV rays. But I, I'm just not sure about the north. I'll have to look into that. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I don't know. I mean, it's all, I guess, uh, if people think it's, it's going to reach the market, I would think that more and more skin products are going to be uh, interested, interesting to men. And, you know, it also helps prevent you know, the fo whole photoaging and cosmesis. It's not just skin cancer prevention. When you have those metals in there, that, that's why that, that helps prevent photoaging better than just sunscreen uh, without the, the titanium or the zinc. Uh, so we'll see. I guess the, the future will... Let us know. But it's a great idea. Yes. Oh, but there was another question over there. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Yes. Yes. Two questions. Two questions. Okay. Yeah, so for the first question, I'm just not sure about global warming and the association between that and cancer. I would expect that you know, the ozone layer and what may lead to the deterioration of that in terms of pollution and otherwise could also be leading to global warming. So I think that there might be an association in some way, but you know, causal association would probably be difficult to find. So in terms of the, the second comment you made, uh, in terms of in that study, black people not having as good a survival. Now, I'm just not sure about the details of that. You know, what, what I had um, learned was more of an uh, epidemiological just association. It didn't give much information as to why that might be happening. But it's an important topic I want to learn more about. Well, so let me just go back to that slide if I can. So you're, you're being diagnosed at, at higher stages here. Um, but stage for stage, so this star here means that it wasn't significantly different. So although it's a worse number, you know, metastatic disease, everyone's surviving about the same stage per stage. So it's getting maybe diagnosed later. And nu numerically, it might look a little worse, but statistically, in this paper, it wasn't, it wasn't actually, actually uh, worse. Like you couldn't really associate um, being black with a worse survival uh, after diagnosis. So, I'm, not, so I'm, I'm saying that black people are not dying more stage per stage, just really more diagnosed later, at a later stage. Yes. Um, 
It can, yeah, but it's not always. Yeah, not always. You know, some people, I mean, you could go along for years <laughs> with one of these brewing and enlarging in size, and I've been shocked with how, how large some of these tumors are, and people are just going on like they're not even there. So it, it's variable.